Millions of Americans know this president is unfit for office. They need to know that a Democratic Congress would do what is morally and urgently necessary for the health of our democracy. The prospect of Democrats taking control of the U.S. Congress in November is inspiring more calls for Donald Trump to be impeached. But famed lawyer Alan Dershowitz says that would be a mistake. In his new book, The Case Against Impeaching Trump, Dershowitz argues that ousting the president would not equate to holding power to account, but instead would be criminalizing unpopular political views. He also writes that a special prosecutor's investigation into suspected collusion with Russia risks violating the U.S. Constitution. Well, let's welcome back to the program Alan Dershowitz, who joins us now from his home in New York and from San Diego. Former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Harry Littman. Thanks both so much for joining us. Alan Dershowitz, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, You've never been a Trump supporter. You very vocally voted for Hillary Clinton. You supported her campaign. So before we get into the arguments for and against impeachment, I first need to ask you why you wrote this book. I wrote this book because I was expecting that Hillary Clinton would be elected president. And I thought that the Republicans on day one would try to impeach her. They were already organizing to impeach her on January 21st um, of 2017. And I had already done the research on impeachment because I had helped represent Bill Clinton when he was impeached. And then when Donald Trump got elected president and they tried to impeach him, I thought it would be extremely hypocritical for me not to put forth my arguments that I would have put forth for Hillary Clinton for Donald Trump. I'm a neutral, objective, civil libertarian, and uh, I always express my views without regard to partisanship. Uh, for me, the test is always the shoe on the other foot test. If the shoe were on the other foot, if it were Hillary Clinton who were being impeached, would I be making these arguments? The answer is yes. So it's Donald Trump, whose policies I disagree with and who I voted against, who is now uh, being the subject of talk about impeachment. And so I decided to write the same book I would have written. In fact, to make the point, my publisher came out with a mock cover for the book called The Case Against Impeaching Clinton. The book is exactly the same, just the cover and the title are different. Okay, so, I mean, the book is, is lengthy. We don't have time to go over every detail of it uh, in this segment. But tell us, give us the gist of why you discourage impeachment in Trump's case. Well, there are a lot of reasons. <clears throat> I don't make the political case against impeachment. Others are making it that it would backfire, that they would never get a vote in the Senate to, uh, to vote him out, and therefore it would eventually hurt the Democrats. I don't make that argument. I make a purely constitutional argument. Um, I went back to the original framers of the Constitution and came to the conclusion they wanted to make impeachment very hard. They rejected the argument that some put forward that a president can be impeached for maladministration of office or for doing a terrible job. And instead, they opted for a process where the president had to be prosecuted uh, in the Senate for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And I interpret that, and the framers interpret it, as meaning real crimes, uh, actual crimes. Uh, treason, bribery are real, real crimes. And I have seen no evidence of real crimes committed by Donald Trump. Maybe the evidence will emerge, and if so, I would change my view. But in the absence of evidence of real crimes, I think the case against impeachment is very strong. Okay, so let me ask Harry, what do you make of the merits of this book and Alan's case against impeachment here? That Thanks, because that's what matters. Of course, we can all agree with the shoe on the other foot test, and we should, we should be applying the same arguments no matter who's the president. But what matters is Professor Dershowitz's substantive constitutional views. He's got a two-part argument. The first is, as he's just said, you can only impeach for an actual crime on the books. As to that, I'll just say it's been widely rejected, and I'm quoting now Professor Dershowitz in saying that. The longest footnote in his book is all the scholars who disagree with him. And I'll just add to that Alexander Hamilton, who made clear in The Federalist, the framers were much more worried about having mm -hmm. another King George, a, a uh, 
a violation of public trust than they were about, say, private finances. But I want to put that to the side because the second big tenet of Professor Dershowitz is, I think, what really matters here. He says, and I'll quote him, that for the president, you may not question why he is doing things. If he, uh, to put it, his words are, if he pardons, that's it. If he fires, that's it. And that's a really radical and, uh, okay. and I think, inaccurate view. I'll just make three quick points about it. The first is it's wrong in the constitutional text. Treason and bribery, as he mentioned, already require the Congress to delve into the president's state of mind. Treason's a specific intent crime. Bribery has a corrupt purpose requirement. Second, as an outlier argument, in his own words, it's very odd that he gives no Supreme Court or case precedent at all, as far as I can see, and there are half a dozen Supreme Court cases going the other way. And then third, it seems to me clear the consequences yeah. of his views are extreme and something we would reject. It would mean that if he pardons with the president every illegal immigrant except Muslims, that would be okay. You can't look into the reasons. If he fires every Jewish member of the senior executive staff, that would be okay. If he fires, that's it. I think that's the implication of his view, and it must be wrong. Alan, go ahead. I can see you had a response. No, it's just not the implication of my views. He, he has my views all wrong. Um, what I say is that if a president acts legitimately, if he pardons legitimately, obviously, if he's given a bribe, that's a crime. But if he pardons somebody legitimately the way uh, George H.W. Bush pardoned um, Casper Weinberger and five other people in order to make sure that they didn't point the finger back at him and the special prosecutor in that case specifically found that he had done it to prevent the investigation from going forward, that you can't question a president's motives if his act was legitimate. If he refused to pardon Muslims, that act would be illegitimate. And that's what the Supreme Court held in the travel ban case. You look at the actions, not the motives. So my point is a rather different one, and that is if the president acts properly, firing Comey is a legitimate action, you can't question the president's motives. Why? Presidents have mixed motives, always. Part of their motives are financial. They want to write a good book and a profitable book after they leave office. Will this act help them get a big advance? They want to go down in history in a positive way. Okay. Will this act help them in a positive way? Will it help their party so get reelected? So a couple reelected? points, Andrea. Will it do other and things? When we start probing right. the motives of a president, let me finish. When we start probing the motives of a president, we really get to the British system. Now, for treason, of course, if you commit an act of treason, okay. then intent is necessary. But I know of no crime in which a legitimate act can then be turned into a crime by looking and probing the motive of the president okay. under Article 2 of the Constitution. Harry, a quick response. The minutes are winding down, All sir. Right. We have other, other things a to get to. Go ahead. Two, two quick responses. First, this legitimate and properly is a new insertion from Professor Dershowitz. There's a lot in that, and obviously it must implicate no, some there. kind of thing about state of mind. On mixed motives, excuse me, Professor, on mixed motives, that's a pedestrian view in the criminal law you teach your class. Of course it can be hard to ferret out the proper motives, but if you ferret it out, if you have a videotape of Trump saying, here's the reason I want to do it, and it's the same reason Nixon did say when the Congress impeached him for exactly this, then obviously you have a problem. It turns mm -hmm. on motive necessarily. There's no Supreme Court I'm, case I'm a bit, that says you can impeach a president for non-criminal actions, I'm a bit period. worried that Six. the discussion Six. might be getting out of the realm of the understanding of many mm -hmm. of our international viewers Six. here. It's highly specific. But le let me ask you this. Sorry. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, do you perhaps recognize, as some, as some have argued, that it is just at its most basic level somewhat dangerous in the political atmosphere in the United States right now to publish a book titled what you've titled it, knowing that many will rightly or wrongly see it as a political endorsement of a man whom you disagree with on most all accounts and whom many of your former supporters or his supporters, former supporters, would find dangerous uh, for the United States. I've been doing this all my life. When I was a student in college, I was very anti-communist, but I defended the rights of communists to teach and to speak, and people called me a communist sympathizer. When Nazis tried to march through Skokie, Illinois, in a neighborhood of Holocaust survivors, I objected to them trying to censor him and therefore defended the rights of Nazis to march through Skokie. People call me a Nazi sympathizer. 
When I defended O.J. Simpson, people said I was sympathetic to murder. All my life, I've defended people I've disagreed with. That's what a civil libertarian does. That's what a neutral, objective defender of the Constitution does. So, of course, many people have quite willfully, and some inadvertently, identified my defense of Trump's civil liberties and constitutional rights with support for his policy. So I go out of my way on every show to say, I disagree with his immigration policy. Okay. I wrote an op-ed against what he said at Charlottesville. I disagree with his tax policies, with his health care policies. Okay. I voted against him, but I demand that we have a single standard of civil liberties and constitutional law for everyone. Okay, and quickly, Harry, is that ultimately good for democracy, even if you disagree? Yeah, I agree it's commendable he wrote the book. What's deeply wrong-headed is the constitutional views that he advances in the book. Okay. So argue with them, that's fine, and we'll have a debate, and let the public decide who's right. Ultimately, maybe the courts will decide who's right. Okay. <laughs> Professor Dershowitz, I will give you the last word there, because very unfortunately, we are out of time for this segment of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank you both. Harry Littman, Alan Dershowitz, so much for joining us.